गुड इवनिंग सर मोनिका यस सर गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग वन सेकेंड सर आई स्विच ऑन माई वीडियो Oh, uh, have you given? Uh, have they given you the facility for screen sharing? Yes. Actually, uh, have shared with me uh, oh. for joining the program. Okay. So, in that screen share option is open in my screen, sir. Okay, that's great. So, I'll just start sharing, sir. If just let me know if you can see my slides. After uh, I start, sir, I'll switch off my video for bandwidth sake. Okay. Yes, sir. We'll wait for about uh, another ten minutes. We will start at eight fifteen. Oh, okay, sir. Whatever you say, whatever you're comfortable. Okay, I am comfortable to start now. But I thought uh, after the la the previous program, we can give a back of a, a gap. So, uh, so you can see my. Very good. I think good slides. I can see them. Very good. Okay, sir. Thanks, sir. I'll try my best, sir. Uh, I have prepared this presentation. Mo most of it is prepared uh, from your notes. I got it from a friend in Chennai. Oh. And one friend in Bangalore. Oh, oh. Long back, I got maybe three years back. Oh, I see. <laughs> so most of the uh, presentation is prepared from those notes, and some from Parlov. Okay, right. So I think it should be. Quite useful for most of the students, uh, especially when they are appearing for the examination. If there is a continuous murmur, now the the, the uh, for the uh, tuition, yes. how to differentiate what are the products? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mostly, I read from there only, sir. Uh, just some elaboration I have taken from you know for understanding sake, because many of them uh, are not into congenital heart diseases. Oh, so okay. for understanding sake, I have uh, added some from information from Parlov. Okay, that's great. But most of it uh, is from uh, your uh, notes, sir. Those okay. same triple M notes. Sir. Okay, okay, right. I'll try. You can correct me, sir. Ah, yeah, no, I'm also yeah. a new person. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, you are not uh, any more new to me because uh, uh, I yeah, have we have been right discussing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am privileged to be your student now. <laughs> I think you are quite uh, quite active and quite uh, enthusiastic to learn. Also, I think that's a very good quality that somebody wants to further your other knowledge and also want to discuss. All these are good qualities of an excellent. Student who would like to up, uh, um, update the knowledge and improve uh, the improve the uh, the information that they have. I think that's a very good quality. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, sir. First time we met in Echo India, you personally congratulated me, and uh -huh. that was a moment for me <laughs> when I touched your feet for the first time <laughs> in Mumbai. Okay, okay, right, right. Uh, at that time, were you working with uh, uh, Hindu Jazz? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So that is also one case we have came across with a continuous murmur, which I presented that time. Yeah, I think you must have been. Usually, I congratulate only when I am thoroughly impressed by the presentation of the candidate. That is what Pondi sir told me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a moment for me, sir. Indeed. I think that session is about to be over. I disconnect, continued from. But sir, lot of things I will learn today as well from you. So we'll see. Okay. So shall we start then? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay. Sure. Okay. Sure. Right. Uh, friends and students, today we are having a session on a continuous murmur. Continuous murmur sometimes uh, uh, is uh, becomes a challenge, especially. When in a congenital heart disease, and today to tell us about the continuous murmur, we have uh, Dr. Monica 
pushed from is a student from um, from the uh, KMC Manipal. She has already cleared her DM, but now she is preparing for her DNB, and uh, so we, we we should be certain that she 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 must be bringing with total knowledge, plenty of knowledge, and that will help us to learn more about continuous member. Over to Monica, please. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Good evening, every sir, and good evening all the participants present here. Uh, I'll be switching off my video for the sake of bandwidth. I'm sorry for that. But thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity to learn from you. So today we are going to discuss about continuous murmur, differential diagnosis of continuous murmur. Before we start, we must know what is continuous murmur. So to as per definition, a continuous murmur is a murmur that begins in systole and continues uninterrupted through second heart sound into a part of diastole without the change in character of the murmur. So, characteristics of continuous murmurs are there is no change in the character of murmur from systole to diastole. The second heart sound is or its components are enveloped or masked by the murmur. There is no break between the systolic and the diastolic components of the murmur and by the whole length of either systolic or diastole. So, Continuous murmurs are physiologically classified by Meyer in 1975. Uh, as per this classification, the broad class they are broadly classified into the uh, continuous murmur caused due to uh, flow from high pressure zone to low pressure zone, like in patent ductus arteriosus. AP window, truncus arteriosus with pulmonary artery stenosis, pulmonary atresia with collaterals, and BT shunts or pot shunts, vatrosin shunts, L kappa, RSOV2, RA or RV, coronary cameral fistulas, Lutenbacher syndrome, particularly that means Lutenbacher's restrictive AST, mitral atresia with AST, post PTMC with AST, and AV fistulas, TAPVC into system veins and photosystemic shunts. So, continuous murmur caused due to increased flow include continuous murmur due to venous hum, mammary shuffle, hemangiomas, hyperthyroidism, hyperemia of neoplasm that is like in hepatoma there is uh, increased flow in the uh, increased vasculature of the tumor. Then, the continuous murmur caused due to significant localized arterial obstruction or stenosis. So, the examples for this continuous murmur include coarctation of aorta, branch pulmonary artery stenosis, carotid uh, stenosis, significant carotid stenosis, femoral arterial stenosis, renal arterial stenosis, and celiac or mesenteric arterial stenosis, which, uh, which are hemodynamically significant. However, continuous murmur are can be closely mistaken for two types of different murmurs, though that is to and fro murmur or a combined systodiastolic murmur. So we must be able to differentiate continuous murmur from to and fro and uh, systodiastolic murmur. So what is to and fro murmur? To and fro murmurs are due to the flow in one direction during systole and flow in reverse direction during diastole through the same orifice or the valve. Typical examples of to and fro murmurs include AS with AR. PS with PR and TOF with absent pulmonary valve. These are not continuous murmurs. The murmurs of the stenotic stenosis are rough, medium pitched, diamond shaped, and get tapered towards the end of systole and ending uh, in or before the aortic component of the second heart sound the or the pulmonary component of the uh, second heart sound. So, this is what to and fro murmur. So, stenotic murmur will. Um, end before the aortic or pulmonary component of second heart sound. The diastolic murmur is in to and fro murmur is a high pitch blowing character after A2 or P2. There is change in the character of the murmur at the boundary of systole and diastole of the cardiac cycle. It has a definite gap at this point with two different peaking of the murmurs during systole and diastole. Moreover, the second heart sound is well audible in these conditions until and unless the valves are grossly deformed or damaged. So it's important for us to distinguish to and fro murmurs from the continuous murmurs. Second important thing to know is combined systodiastolic murmur. So what is what is in combined systodiastolic murmur? The combined systodiastolic murmurs are not due to flow through same orifice or the valve. Rather, 
they are the combination of systolic murmur of one pathology and a diastolic murmur of other pathology so they may be arising from different orifices or the valves so typical examples of combined systo diastolic murmurs include ventricular septal defect with aortic regurgitation and combined mr with ar they occupy various varying length of systole or diastole and they are different in character in systole and diastole so you can definitely hear two different kinds of murmur two different peaks at two different sites so how how will we uh, differentiate or how will we determine two different components of these murmurs so like in vsd with ar vsd murmurs are usually high pitched and best heard at the high pitch pan systolic best heard at the left sternum border ar murmur is early diastolic at the left second or third intercostal space so but when the murmurs are traced from the infra uh, up to the infra clavicular area from the left sternum uh, border you can definitely hear two different murmurs of two different qualities with distinguished s2 and its components which are well heard and the peaking of the murmurs are different which do not peak around s2 so it is important how will we determine or differentiate systo diastolic murmur from a continuous murmur so when we trace the murmur up uh, to the infra clavicular area you can hear two different murmurs s2 can be well heard distinguished and two different peaks of the murmur can be appreciated so this is a this is for revision sake for the exam going students as well as me uh, how to like, this is the classical examples of continuous to and fro and uh, combined systo diastolic murmurs and how will we uh, no we have already discussed that because of time constraint i will run through this slide uh, this is an important slide for understanding this is the diagrammatic representation of the shapes of the murmur three these three murmurs so first one is a continuous murmur which peaks around uh, s2 second is the to and fro murmurs wherein you can see it is through it is through the same orifice however it has two different peaks and uh, systo diastolic murmurs are dif two different murmurs all together for uh, discussion sake we'll be today classifying this murmurs into thoracic and extra thoracic continuous murmur and one by one we'll go through it so first we'll discuss precordial con th thoracic precordial continuous murmur so first in the line is patent ductus arteriosus so classic description of pda murmur was given by george gibson in 1900 hence it is also known as gibson's murmur the murmur of uncomplicated pda peaks around s2 and continues without any interruption through s2 and decreases in intensity during diastole however the murmur is a best heard it's best heard in the left infraclavicular for, uh, or first or second left inter intercostal space which are also called as gibson's area so this is where we hear the gibson's pda murmur ideal uh, ideal site for uh, or ideal location for hearing or auscultating pda murmur this is the doppler form of continuous murmur of ductus and this is the classical continuous murmur of pda phonocardiogram so moderate to large restrictive pdas produce a noisy machinery murmur which is punctuated with the ad sound the ad sounds are created due to the collisions of the two jets which uh, set the whole system into the vibrations which create this ad sounds so with the development of pulmonary hypertension uh, these ad sounds are heard particularly in ap windows and pdas because of the high flow jets uh, setting the system into the vibrations there is early collision of the streams from ductus and pulmonary artery which causes ad sound so uh, continuous murmur which are associated with ad sound best heard in first and second left intercostal space which in, uh, should suspect pda however with the development of pulmonary hypertension the diastolic component of the ductus continuous murmur decreases so and when the right to left shunt uh, occurs that is when the ductus is eisenmengerized there is no murmur at all this is how we differentiate the uh, various pdas at different stages 
early non restrictive periods will have continuous murmur moderately restrictive periods will have continuous murmur then as the pulmonary hypertension develops the diastolic component decreases as the shunt becomes right to left it will as it is eisenmengerized the murmur disappears so what happens uh, to pda murmur on dynamic auscultation uh, isometric hand grip hand grip will increase uh, systemic vascular resistance so increase the murmur valsalva maneuver will decrease the murmur and amyl nitrate decreases the murmur and decreases the diastolic component of the murmur okay this is the phonocardiogram for pda murmur so this is the classical continuous murmur through a non restrict the through a uh, pda restrictive pda and this is the large pda with decreased diastolic component as we can see on the doppler doppler due to development of pulmonary hypertension so we should know what are the when pda does not have a continuous murmur so pda in young neonates may not have a continuous murmur very small ductus very large ductus with pulmonary hypertension eisenmengerized ductus or when the ductus is associated with preductal coarctation aortic stenosis or large ventricular septal defect they may not produce continuous murmur this is important for viva second in the line is aorto pulmonary window only 20% of aorto pulmonary windows are usual i actually associated with continuous murmur because most of the ap windows are large and non restrictive and pulmonary arterial pressures are already elevated by the time they are diagnosed and so the the, the diastolic component of the con continuous murmur is uh, is not there so whenever ap window is restrictive then only it can produce a continuous murmur so when continuous murmur is present it tends to be very short in ap window also the location of the uh, continuous murmur in ap window uh, how will we differentiate it from pda the location is little lower than the pda location so it is important in continuous murmur the site of the murmur is very important which which almost always gives us an idea about the diagnosis so ap window continuous murmur in patients with restrictive ap windows they will have a long continuous murmur identical to pda but the location will be lower in third intercostal space so this is a non restrictive the, the this is a non restrictive ap window wherein you will not get a continuous murmur only moderately restrictive aorto pulmonary windows will generate a continuous murmur and 80% of the patient the murmur is systolic rather than continuous now this is a non restrictive ap window we can see in the echo which has no continuous murmur now i will show you a restrictive ap window so this is a restrictive ap window recently we have seen this case a 12 years old uh, female child referred to us for pda closure when i did the echo myself i could see there was no ductus but however there was a continuous murmur so i kept on searching where is this flow coming from and i could grab this uh, restrictive ap window very next day we closed that window with an ado1 device so this is an angiographic uh, represent angiographic view of restrictive ap window and this is the device closure for ap window see the location of the ap window it is lower now third in the line is rupture of sinus of valsalva rsov this now we have to concentrate on this if there is sudden appearance of a superficial loud sawing continuous murmur in a previously healthy individual which does not peak around second heart sound with an accentuation of diastolic component suggests the presence of rsov or ruptures of sinus of valsalva this murmur is usually continuous when rsov occurs in ra ra or rb it may be continuous when rsov occurs into la which is very rare but it is early diastolic when the sinus of valsalva aneurysm ruptures into lv because the lv pressures are high it also becomes early diastolic when there is the uh, pulmonary hypertension supervenes with high rb uh, pressures which shortens or abolishes the systolic flow 
and the systolic component of the murmur. So the mur murmur generally becomes early diastolic. When RSOV patients develop pulmonary hypertension. It is more superficial murmur with a prominent diastolic thrill which is described as a pur purring of a cat. It is maximally heard at the lower left sternal border or over the zip point corresponding to the location of receiving chamber. So it depends on the site where the RSOV is rup has ruptured. So when the RSOV ruptures into RA, the, con the continuous murmur is best heard in right or left sternal border over or the lower sternum. When the RSOV, this is the example of RSOV rupturing into RA. Can see a flow. When RSOV ruptures into the body of RV, the murmur is best heard in the mid lower sternal border. Rupture uh, when the rupture uh, RSOV ruptures in, uh, into RV near the tricuspid orifice, it may be associated with the uh, continuous murmur at the right sternal edge. However, when the RSOV ruptures into RVOT, the murmur is higher in the left sternal edge. However, the character of this murmur is like a purring of a cat. So we must be able to distinguish. And yes, some most of the times patient will have uh, will be extremely symptomatic uh, on presentation. So is my video running, sir? Yeah, yeah, it's running. No okay. problem. So this is the example of uh, RSOV rupturing into the body of RP and the continuous Doppler pattern. So RSOV usually, uh, just uh, to revise about the RSOV, it usually occurs in adolescence or early adulthood. Male to female ratio is between uh, between 1.7 to 4 as to 4. Uh, 1.7 to 4 as to 1. Most commonly, right sinus ruptures into RV or sometimes into RA. Non coronary sinus always ruptures into RA. Left sinus ruptures very rarely, but it may, mostly it ruptures in LV. So, this is a revision slide for Viva's sake how to differentiate. Basically, it is to be differentiated on the basis of. Um, Intensity of continuous murmur when it if it is more in systole, it is uh, RSOV is ruptured into RA, and if it is more in diastole, the RSOV is generally ruptured has ruptured in the uh, RV, and the character of the murmur will be like a purring of a cat. So this is important. We must remember. Mm. One of the very important features of RSOV MDA. is that. That it is uh, a superficial thrill. I think you must stress yes, the yes. superficial thrill, which yes, always yes. distinguishes the RSOV from all other lesions. And also, unlike the other continuous vermis, as uh, Monica has rightly pointed out, which peaks in the uh, around the second heart sound, the RSOV murmur, especially when it ruptures into the RV, uh, is louder during diastole than in systole. That's a, this is the only murmur, which continuous murmur, which is louder during uh, diastole than in systole. So, a uh, very superficial thrill, very loud murmur, louder during diastole, audible in the third or sometimes even fourth left in the course space that always points towards the rupture of sinus of Elsalva into the right ventricle. And if the murmur is sometimes heard both on the right or on and on the left side or maybe sometimes audible better on the right side, then that points to a possibility of a rupture into the right atrium. Right atrial uh, rupture sinus of Elsalva also will be having a superficial thrill but then the murmur can be louder during systole than in diastole. When the ruptured sinus, when the sinus ruptures into the left atrium, that is the only situation sometimes when no thrill may be felt in a ruptured sinus of itself. Yes, okay, yes. Right. Yes, okay. yes. I'll okay. go ahead. I'll go ahead. Go ahead. So we'll go to the next and uh, next uh, anomaly. That is anomalous left coronary artery originating from main pulmonary artery or pulmonary artery, that is alkappa. This can cause audible precordial continuous murmur. But because of retrograde flow from the right coronary artery, which comes in the left coronary artery and then flows into the pulmonary artery. So, continuous murmur generated by the flow through the intercoronary intra anastomosis, which does not peak around S2, 
softer in uh, systole and louder in diastole and this pathology is very rare and may be present with may present with ischemic changes in ecg in infancy or young adults or heart failure within first year of life so this is an angiogram of uh, alcapa you can see a dilated huge right coronary artery which is uh, providing collaterals to the left side, left coronary system we can see in levoflace the uh, left coronary system is getting uh, visualized this is lateral view just to show the extent of collateralization and the tortuous hugely dilated right coronary artery uh monica you have said that continuous murmur generated by flow through in intercoronary anastomosis yes uh, sir uh, thereby you mean that uh, there are no direct communication between the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery is that is that what you are aiming at because usually the patients without uh, continuous murmur are more serious they have more myocardial infarction and they develop heart failure quite early in life and many of them succumb to the disease unless it is identified early and revascularized re sir absence of continuous murmur in alcapa patient itself we is due to uh, lack of collateralization yeah or, this is like collateralization and uh, so then, uh, that, is why, oh. that is yeah. why they will succumb to death or that is why they will have suffer more heart failure or mis in early age uh, yeah. recently we came across a child sir this is the same child wherein there were no coronary collaterals only the means of collaterals uh, were there directly co uh, collaterals were there from the aorta Col collaterals from, ay from aorta to where it was opening directly into the body sir into the body of the of the ventricles the left ventricle or right ventricle rv and few in lv Oh, I see. That's very unusual. That's uh, very unusual. This is two months old child who presented with heart failure. Usually, what is the usually what is the hemodynamics of uh, of uh, uh, Alcapa without collaterals? What 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 is the what is the hemodynamics? Usually, pres patients will present with uh, heart failure within one year of life, and uh, they will have uh, hypotension, MIs. in early infancy or adulthood and they will have hypotension sir uh, uh, how are the coronary left coronary field then what is uh, what is how uh, this see uh, the aortic pressure is uh, the, the the the, the uh, pulmonary artery pressure is much lower and lower. how can the uh, how can the coronaries be filled in these patients what is the hemodynamics in this patient sir yeah those patients there are no sir. intercoronary I'm, collaterals yeah i'm not sure sir i'll read about any, it yeah uh, yeah students any one of you would like to give a comment saroj would you like to give a comment gaurav are you there pan gaurav uh, yes sir yes sir yes sir yes sir you like to give a comment how the coronary risk can yes, be in a patient without significant communication from right coronary artery to left coronary artery where the left coronary artery is rising and obviously uh, from the pulmonary artery sir some flow can be there in the diastole sir some flow can be there in the diastole only some flow in the diastole phase sir see still, still the flow has to come from the pulmonary artery i agree with you that there can be some flow but that may not be enough so what usually happens is that these patients develop heart failure uh, quickly early in the early infancy they develop heart failure when they develop heart failure what happens to pulmonary artery pressure it will go up sir it, it will go up and the pulmonary artery pressure will go up to such an extent that it will be able to fill the left coronary oh okay sir. that's a, say uh, after a week or so uh, the left coronary starts getting filled from the pulmonary artery because these patients they can their pulmonary artery pressure will not regress much they quickly go in for pulmonary arterial hypertension and then the coronaries can be filled from the pulmonary artery so that is one uh, nature's protection that these patients can still survive because of the coronary artery blood flow 
what is the purpose of uh, pulmonary is getting deoxygenated blood what is the purpose of deoxygenated blood the circulating into the coronaries is there any, is there any purpose see because you know the uh, the pulmonary artery is getting blood from the venous system the venous system gets blood which has already been where the oxygen has been extracted by the tissues and that blood when it is perfused to the coronaries does it serve any purpose monica would you like to give a gaurav would you like to give a comment the uh, when the blood from the pulmonary artery is perfused through the coronaries into the into the uh, into the myocardium does it supply oxygen to the myocardium you sure i am not sure about this but i haven't read about it but uh, uh, as it happens in cyanotic congenital heart diseases when the uh, low oxygenation means uh, deep um, blood with uh, low oxygen content flows through coronaries coronaries usually uh, dilated and tortuous and they don't have much of atherosclerosis that oh, is what right. uh, now what is the what is the what uh, yes yes gaurav Sir, sir, the coronary extraction is hundred percent. So, so some oxygen they will have, and uh, uh, and it can be for the metabolite uh, runoff. Uh, that is known. Very good. Okay. See, what is the normal oxygen saturation of the of the venous blood? Around forty percent. So, forty to fifty percent. No, venous venous blood is around seventy to seventy-five. Seventy, sixty-five to seventy percent. So, they are even. Yes, yes. If there is a good cardiac output, it may even be seventy-five. What is the uh, the oxygen saturation of coronary sinus? Thirty-five percent. Thirty-five percent. So, actually, the myocardium extracts hundred percent of available oxygen in just one circulation, while tissues. only absorb about 30 to 35% of the extractable oxygen that is why actually tissues can improve the oxygen supply even without increasing the cardiac output while my coronaries can increase the oxygen delivery or the oxygen delivery to the myocardium can be increased only by increasing the blood flow it cannot extract any more oxygen so uh, uh, normally coronary the myocardium extracts 100% of the extractable oxygen in just one circulation while tissues extract only one third so even if the the, the oxy the blood which has flown through the uh, tissues and the tissues have extracted whatever is required for their demand oxygen even that blood can be uh, supplying oxygen to coronary to the myocardium because myocardium can still further extract oxygen another 40% maybe from 75% it can still go down to about 35% so still the oxygen supply to the myocardium can still be maintained even when the ox the coronaries are perfused with mixed on or vein assembled or blood is that clear to you yes sir yes sir very much okay, okay right go ahead thank go. you so much yeah. so the here uh, just to have uh, what are the eco signs we must look for when we are suspecting alkapa is papillary muscle calcification one additional finding apart from visualizing the anomalous coronary artery itself with lv dysfunction now site the continuous murmur in alkapa is variably located uh, to the left or right sternum at the base of the heart the murmur is generated by collateral flow between rc and lc which decreases due to compression by increased transmural pressure during systole some patients have associated mr or left ventricular failure which elevates the pulmonary uh, arterial pressure and abolishes the diastolic component of this continuous murmur ecg in alkapa will show deep narrow qvs which is classically seen in alkapa in one and avl left ventricular hypertrophy and left axis deviations sometimes because of the scarring of the tissue there may be fragmented qrs complexes but usually when the patient is having a continuous murmur usually the myocardial damage the uh, papillary muscle, muscle dysfunction leading to mitral regurgitation all those things are much less because uh, yes, the, yes. The, as you have already shown the right coronary artery will dilate to such an extent that it will be able to supply the, the whole oxygen demand of the myocardium even right right ventricle left ventricle and all the uh, the uh, the uh, the left coronary air, uh, territory can be supplied by the 
right coronary artery itself. So usually the murmur, the one which makes noise, that is the one which has got continuous murmur, are less harmful and they have got less complications, less myocardial damage and these patients at a later age can get back to normal uh, uh, myocardial performance once the revascularization is established. While patients who are silent and those patients uh, in whom there is no, no collaterals, they are the ones which, uh, which behave very bad they develop uh, myocardial infarction, they develop uh, enlarged heart, they develop uh, uh, papillary muscle dysfunction, they develop mitral regurgitation, and as you have said, the pulmonary artery pressure goes up and they are in all types of trouble. So usually the one which makes a big noise, usually sometimes some of them may even uh, survive till adulthood and later because of the uh, angina or sometimes because of the murmur, they are uh, investigated and then subsequently they are uh, treated. So, the one which does not make the noise is the one which is uh, which will behave badly and the one which makes the noise very often survives and they continue to continue to survive and they can uh, survive even to adulthood and they can be effectively treated later in life. Okay. Sir, very rightly uh, said, me, sir. Sir, sir? The, hello? This, hello? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir, uh, yes, uh, sir. One third can be asymptomatic also, no, sir? I let I will tell you one second. Like in this example, you okay, can see okay, in the sir. picture, this is an example of a 56 years old male who was diagnosed with Al Kappa three years prior to presentation. Now you can see a very large RC, hugely dilated RC. Can you see? This is an intraoperative image. It is a 56 years old male. And this is a small uh, area of scarring in LED territory. However, patient's LV function was around 50% and there was mild MR, but uh, L kappa we have uh, operated him. It's our what, did you, what did you do? What the surgeon? What, what did the surgeon Actually, do? Actually, there are there are different procedure, Takyoshi procedure, and uh, but uh, in this patient, the length of left main was very small. Oh. So they had to actually bypass, do the bypass itself. Well, 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 what was the bypass they put there? Did they put a uh, lima graft? They put a lima graft. Oh, they put lima a lima graft. Lima graft. graft is very good. Yeah, they Don't have done good. a lima graft. Yeah, okay, right. yes, good. Thanks. So uh, I'll go ahead, sir. Yeah, yes, please. Why it is not? So next in the line is coronary cameral fistula. We many of the times we do see in, uh, du during angiograms. Uh, however, it may not always produce a continuous murmur, which is audible. This condition should always be suspected when an asynotic individual presents with a continuous murmur with maximal at atypical precordial sites. About 50% of this fistula involve right coronary artery and 45% involve right left coronary artery. Site of the murmur depends on the chamber where the coronary cameral fistula is opening and about 90% drain into right side of the heart. So depending on the uh, which chamber the coronary cameral fistula is opening, the site differs. So if uh, the coronary cameral fistula is opening into RV, the continuous murmur may be heard over mid to lower left sternal border over the lower sternum. If it is opening near IVOT, it is in the mid or upper left sternal border. If it is in RA, it may be mid to lower right sternal edge. If it is pulmonary trunk, it may be left second or third intercostal space along the sternal border. If it is opening into left atrium, which is very rare, it may be in the upper to mid left sternal border and may radiate it to axilla. So uh, one, 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 one point, uh, uh, Monica, one point I want to say is that, see, um, uh, many times you will be able to hear the continuous murmur, which are classically uh, so the sites for ruptured sinus of silver. And the, on these sites also, the coronary camera fistula murmurs can be audible. So whenever you are hearing a murmur, continuous murmur in the third, fourth, or on the right side of the sternum, and is not associated with the thrill, always think of coronary camera fistula. Yes, Whenever yes. in a yes. ruptured sense of silver, there will be always, almost always, there will be very superficial thrill, thrill unless the rupture is occurring into the left ear. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, usually continuous murmur of coronary artery fistula are soft, high frequency, and they carry small shunt through narrow pathway. Exceptionally, they produce coarse, rough, and machinery murmurs when the fistula is very large. Like in this patient, this is also our own patient, sir. 
This is large coronary caminal fistula from left coronary artery to right atria and the continuous flow across the coronary caminal fistula. However, we must remember one thing that if in case of coronary artery fistula draining into RV, the murmur softens during systole due to the fistula get compressed uh, due to myocardial uh, uh, contraction. So I'll go ahead, sir. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, sir. And what did in you do for your, what, or, or did you do a interventional procedure to close the uh, cameral fistula or you? Uh, if it is hemodynamically that? significant, usually coronary cameral fistulas you, uh, may uh, be asymptomatic for a long time. Sometimes if it is large, it may be... Uh, it may produce symptoms of angina, heart failure, arrhythmias. So, if the patient is symptomatic and if it is diagnosed hemodynamically significant, sir, we will go ahead uh, and uh, uh, do the interventions. In this patient, we had closed the fistula uh, with a uh, tacron patch on the uh, atrial side and a pericardial patch on the aortic side. The this and uh, she. Actually, it was very close to the ostium. We could, you know, uh, surgeons could uh, maintain the flow in the uh, left coronary system. Oh, I see. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, what, 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 this, this uh, uh, camel fistula was in the left coronary system? Yes, sir, left coronary to right it. Rare. Oh, 39 it. years old females. Rare, rare. And actually, sometimes this uh, uh, coronary cameral fistula is uh, recognized when somebody comes and uh, tells about some non-cardiac chest wall pain in a young young individual. And when he's yes, put yes. on a treadmill, sometimes it becomes positive. And yes, I yes, had sir. two cases where treadmill positive patients, young individuals, when they were uh, subject to a coronary angiogram, had a coronary cameral fistula. Ah, yes, sir. Actually, sir, this patient was a 39 years old female who presented with uh, exertional angina oh, with yes. like three of three months duration. Mm -hmm. uh, um, previously, and, uh, she had no symptoms. Mm -hmm. But why, uh, is it, uh, we, why do they develop? Why do they develop symptoms later? Increased demand, sir. What what demand? Increased myocardial. Actually, she had some hypertension. Her myocardial demand increased due to left ventricular hypertrophy. Earlier, she was not symptomatic. Later, uh, another another the hemodynamic change that may take place is that this uh, coronary cameral fistula, because of the higher pressure, uh, gradually become bigger and bigger and bigger, and then hmm. it will have it's a more right. more steel effect. Yeah, coronary steel effect. Yes, coronary steel effect, and that will cause injury. So, yes, yes. At, at birth and early childhood, it may not be, it may not be symptomatic. Or uh, they may come the symptomatic by middle age or maybe around 30, 35. And when you put them on a treadmill, they become uh, the they become uh, positive treadmill response. That may be partly related to the coronary steel effect because of the growth of the fistula. Fistula strike becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Ultimately, so it, yeah, it becomes a steel effect. Yes. Yes. So the, however, the now the country, when the fistula is uh, opening, yeah, Gaurav, you want to say something? Hello. Yes, Gaurav, you want to. So this make... fistula was uh, percutaneously closed, or uh, this was a no, 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 no. Surgically, surgically, surgically. Sometimes device. Yeah, device okay, okay. closure can be done. However, yeah. in this patient, we have done uh, yeah. um, surgical closure. Most but of the times, uh, this uh, fistula can be uh, uh, closed by uh, device. So only occasionally, only we have to send the case to surgeon. Mm. Okay, Monica, right. Okay, uh, the murmur is not continuous if the fistula is opening into LV due to the high LV pressures. And uh, it may be purely diastolic or systolic and diastolic if it is draining into uh, LV. That is uh, due to the pressures in LV, high pressures in left ventricle. So, this is a small fistula uh, opening into pulmonary artery just to show the location. It's opening. So, it's also, it, we often see in uh, during angiogram, we may be seeing, but we may not be reporting just to show the fistula. Can you see the fistula track? Opening in pulmonary artery. 
Yes, yes, beautifully seen. Actually, yes, yes. Uh, when you do coronary angiogram, small fistulas occasionally do you see, especially in the right ventricle or in some, some someone some into the pulmonary artery, which are asymptomatic and they can be just left alone. And occasionally, that we we do see that, but only when the fistula becomes large and has a steel effect, then only it becomes problematic. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay. Right. Yes. yes sir. So now next is uh, this uh, uh, this is another one uh, rare entity which is aortocameral fistula. These are extremely rare fistula or even aortocameral tunnels. Extremely rare congenital anomaly consists of a vascular channel arising from any of the three sinuses most commonly drains into RA. It can be either anterior or posterior, may be associated with left SSVC or, uh, or ostium secundum AST. And, uh, Patient may remain asymptomatic for a long time or may present with recurrent heart failure, exertional dyspnea, or palpitations or arrhythmias. This is the large autocameral fistula which we have, which I have diagnosed, sir. Thank you. Oh, very good. <laughs> and uh, you can see a large fistula track parallel to the aorta. Can you see, sir, in the third wing, third uh, image? Mm, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the continuous flow across the fistula. What this was is a very large fistula, sir. So what, was the, what was the age of the patient? This patient was 56 years old. But however, 34 years she was diagnosed with some continuous murmur. She was informed that hmm. she had uh, say she has some heart disease. But she, they never evaluate, uh, evaluated her. Um, but this time she came with uh, heart failure. But this uh, this uh, this one may mimic actually PDA murmur. Uh, was it, uh, was he it had, PDA? He had a loud murmur, but the location was little lower than PDA, sir. Oh, was in the third left in the cross space, was it? Third and fourth. Four, oh, that's lower, definitely lower. Ah. Yeah, third PDA, PDA actually it is either in the first or second in the cross second. space. Yes, Otherwise, sir. Sir, when you are in the third left in the cross space, and the murmur simulating PDA, you should always suspect AP, AP, window. Window. AP window. Yes, sir. AP window. But this looked like, uh, means murmur, if uh, uh, this murmur was more similar to, uh, as far as location is concerned, AP window. However, AD sound were, sounds were not there. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, sir. So, okay, right. Go ahead. In this case, I have published, sir. I mean, it's in the process of getting up. Oh, great. Very good. Uh, yeah, we have done a surgical a last, closure. Last, no, last case. This case we have done have the of the last surgery for this patient. No, no, this patient, case. no, because she was. Angio you have which because one? that. Uh, I yes, agree with you. Some of some the people can try can closing <laughs> it for kitten years closure. They they can, but the uh, I have a CT here. The fistula track was huge. In fact, surgery you usually when they operate this fistula, they uh, put a patch in the aortic end and ligate the uh, sorry they ligate the um, aortic end and put a patch in the um, RA end. So this time they had to put patch both the sides because it was huge fistula. For surgeons also, I, I uh -huh. haven't put because it's a long topic. Uh, this uh, I would have covered those images if possible. Oh, actually, Maybe uh, I can show you yeah, at the end is, of the presentation. Is is the, uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, Ma'am, my question is that in the third Anatom Eco window, that LMC origin was also uh, that that is my question, sir. And was that uh, normal? That from the uh, third uh, uh, window, you can see that. Okay, okay. And uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, vessel from the aorta. Uh, Monica, this you, vessel from the aorta. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That was from my the aorta. Was it uh, where, 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 where was it communicating sir, to? Sir, this is the aortic end. Can you see? This is the aortic end in the T short axis. Oh. So, this is the aortic end. My pointer is showing the aortic end. This is a color view of the aortic end of the fistula. Mm -hmm. It was so long that in one view, we could not see the entire fistula. So, we had the fistula. 
in one view one single view we cannot we could not see the fistula entirely mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, anyhow, this was surgically operated, so obviously is, there's the evidence that uh, the, yes, yes. The, the, all, all the cores and uh, uh, the termination of the fistula, everything is very clear because the patient was surgically operated. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, right. Okay. No, we had a CT image, sir. I will show at the end, of, if my time permits, at the end of presentation, I will show. Oh, okay, okay, right. Go I ahead. have it with me. Yes, yes. yes. yes so next is luton becker syndrome so when mitral stenosis coexists with the restrictive interactual communication with left to right shunt leads to a continuous murmur that is luton becker syndrome when luton becker syndrome with restrictive pre presents with restrictive ast then only there is continuous murmur so not uh -huh. all luton beckers will have continuous murmur only the luton backers with restrictive ast will have continuous murmur the murmur is heard at the third fourth right intercostal space right uh, or the right sternal border because the murmur is generated with the within the cavity of right atrium it is associated with loud s1 and opening snap is present my however also mitral atresia with restrictive ast and one of my professors told mitral atresia with associated left lsvc can have continuous murmur as well. So, oh, yeah. and see, uh, mitral atresia with uh, restrictive ASD behaves something like a uh, severe form of mitral stenosis. Yes, sir. Yes. So, um, mitral stenosis, I have seen two cases. Uh, not gluten backers. They are actually in these two cases. Actually, the um, patent foramen ovale opened up, opened and the patient, up. Yeah, the yeah. patient had a continuous murmur. Right. In yes, both yes, the yes. patients, the, the the continuous murmur was loudest in the third right in the causal space. Yes, yes, sir. This is the sites are very important as far as continuous murmur diagnosis is concerned. So we have it's very important to uh, determine the location of continuous murmur. Okay, right, go ahead. So, another precaution. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes. What is your doubt? So, I am interrupting again. As no as problem. In ASD site, it will be ejection systolic only. In ASD, it will be mainly ejection systolic only because pressure difference between LA and RA will not be so much. That was my doubt in that last. Listen to me. It is only when the mitral stenosis is associated with restrictive ASD that means a yes. small ASD with a velocity higher than 2 okay. which will have a continuous murmur not all luten backers will have a continuous murmur other luten backers with a larger ASD okay. will have a systolic ejection systolic murmur they are with loud S1 and an opening snap uh, Gaurav, see, usually you get a continuous murmur when the left atrial pressure is around 25-30 because of mitral stenosis and the right atrial pressure remains by about maybe about 5 or 6 because the atrial septal defect is uh, quite small and it cannot so, uh, it cannot give rise to large volume of left to right shunt. Uh, uh, but when the pressure goes up, it produces a turbulence and then you can get a continuous problem. No, see when the when the patient is having mitral stenosis, when the left atrial pressure has gone up to 25 or 30, and the right atrial pressure is in the region of let us say 5 or 7, then there is a gradient of around 20 to 25, or uh, maybe around 25, which will give rise to a continuous uh, turbulence uh, through the uh, through the small ASD or maybe even patent foramen ovale which has opened out, and that will give rise to a continuous murmur. Actually, it is a very loud murmur. I had two cases. Both of them had a really loud murmur. Hmm. Okay, right. Yes, go ahead, Monica. Yes. So now, last in the line of precordial continuous murmur is uh, mammary cephal. So mammary cephal present in ten to fifteen percent of the women at the end of pregnancy or immediate postpartum period. Continuous murmur are maximum in intensity during systole, audible in intercostal spaces from second to fourth, both sides or either side. Uh, a light compression of the breast. To the breast can tends to increase the intensity. However, if you uh, if you give heart compression, it will abolish the murmur. So standing may diminish the intensity of this continuous murmur. Now we come to extra precordial continuous murmur. So first is coarctation of aorta. Uh, continuous murmur can be heard across coarctation of aorta only in severe coarctation. 
in which the developed collateral circulation is not sufficient to ensure the normal flow in diastole does it makes a continuous gradient in systole as well as diastole therefore continu the uh, continuous murmuring coarctation of aorta is best heard in the posterior chest in interscapulo vertebral area with a maximum intensity in systole if the patient with coarctation a con uh, in a patient with coarctation a continuous murmur may be from the dilated collaterals also so uh, depending on the location we can determine whether it this murmur is coming from the coarctation or it is coming from the collaterals so this is a diagrammatic representation however uh, of the coarctation of aorta sides it's very important so continuous murmur in coarctation is heard over the thorax and is produced by rapid flow through the tortuous intercostal collaterals a continuous murmur may be may also be produced at the site of coarctation and uh, it's best heard over the back as i discussed interscapular inter vertebral space uh, region uh, when the coarctation diameter is less than 2.5 mm then only the, it can produce a continuous murmur throughout the cardiac cycle so this is important point not all coarctation will have a continuous murmur uh, uh, at the site of coarctation only when the diameter is very small particularly it, when it is smaller than 2.5 mm then continuous murmur is present throughout the cardiac cycle no 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 monica when you think hemodynamically there should be a, a, a significant gradient across the coaxial segment even during diastole diastole yes oh, sir so yes. that is the one which gives rise to continuous normal yes, and this sir. usually happens when there is a as you rightly said when the upper upper portion of the aorta aortic pressure is significantly elevated and also the patient is having a, a significantly narrowed segment so that there is continuous turbulence across the coaxial segment yes sir Uh, this value is from Perloff, sir. Per, as Perloff mentions, it uh, if the diameter is less than two point five mm, then the continuous murmur will be definitely heard in coarctation. No, it is not only the 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 the, the uh, size of the coax segment that that's very important. But if the patient is having very large collaterals, yes, sir, it may then not. The, have... Then you may not get a continuous murmur yes, at the yes, coax sir. segment side, but you may get a continuous murmur in the axilla because of the collateral flow. Yes, sir. yes. Sir. So location is important to determine whether it is coming from coarctation or the uh, intercostal collaterals. So it's a high frequency continuous murmur in case of coarctation of aorta. So this is a this is an echo. You can see a very narrow con coarcted segment of uh, aorta, descending thoracic aorta. And this is a continuous murmur. However, you can see the uh, here it is little larger. Size is important, but at the same time, the the pressure. Uh, but this was that is what I wanted to say, sir. This mm -hmm. size is little uh, is smaller. However, the the diastolic component is uh, less in the uh, second patient. So mm -hmm. the patient had a very low. diastolic murmur it wasn't a classical uh, continuous murmur then next in the example is top with pulmonary atresia with large map cars direct or indirect uh, systemic collaterals produce continuous murmurs in 80% of the patients with top with pulmonary atresia more common in extra precordial sites the intensity varies from soft to readily detectable murmurs and uh, the most important characteristic is you may hear this continuous murmur at one point of time and suddenly uh, next time when you see the patient that murmur may not be there because this uh, this collaterals are uh, very prone for stenosis so usual uh, so it's important it may be at variable sites depending on the uh, collateral location and uh, this continuous murmur is coming from collaterals if they get stenosed you may not get a continuous murmur so usual sites are beneath the clavicle back right or left infra axillary areas and sometimes equally distributed on both the sides of the chest so this is an example of adult top with pulmonary atresia he is a 21 years old boy with uh, pulmonary atresia you can see there is no um, I, actually i did not show the anti grade flow there was no anti grade flow there is pulmonary atresia and these are the large map cars and a large map cars were there and patient had um 
you know ecg showed lvh and lv uh, volume overload oh well yes so, so much was the sun oh i see yes sir yes sir oh. yes sir Uh, what was the saturation? What was the saturation? Saturation was eighty-one. Okay. Oh, if the LV LV was showing volume overload, I would have expected the saturation to be much higher. Higher, yes, sir. But it was eighty-one. Hmm. Of course, it is described that uh, large uh, large planters can give rise to even uh, some of these patients can even develop Eisenmenger syndrome, especially the problem because they are directly connected with aorta. And it yes. gives like a PDA, and the yes. permanent vascular resistance can actually go up. Yes, sir. He said yes, okay. he was twenty-one. Yes. He was so dark, sir, that uh, parents never ever noticed cyanosis. He was oh, that sir. dark. So, so he had a uh, very effective. It was very uh, difficult uh, for me to, uh, you know, elicit history of cyanosis. There was no history of cyanosis. Mm. So even from, uh, no, from early, early childhood, he had effective collaterals. Hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. X-ray is still uh, R V F X. X-ray is still showing the R V F R V F X, sir. X-ray upturned is there, sir. F X. So X-ray is still showing R V F X. Upturned. Uh, uh, but uh, I don't know whether it can be purely called as R V. I agree with you that there is some obtained effects. Maybe that the effects which was more obtained, maybe more and more coming back to more of an L V type, because it is not the classical. Uh, obtaining of the uh, apex of the tetralogy of hell. But uh, I also I, agree with you that uh, it is not the LV type of apex, but rather it is more, more, uh, more likely to be an RV apex. Yes, correct, sir. I agree with you. But however, ECG and uh, all clinical findings were like you know. Yeah, it is well described. ECG was uh, uh, obviously LVH was there. Oh, I see. Was the patient having uh, uh, any other anomaly like serious hypertension? No. Was the child having hemoptysis? Hemoptysis and his BP was. He came presented with hemoptysis. Okay, okay. Okay, go ahead. Yes, sir. Now, next in the line is TAPVC. TAPVC drains into systemic vein by may produce uh, continuous mama. A continuous mama is noteworthy, although uncommon auscultatory sign that originates. In the continuous flow through venous confluence, uh, in the left vertical vein or the left denominate vein, that is, large TAPVCs without obstruction can still have continuous murmur. However, obstructed TV vertical vein will almost always will have a uh, continuous murmur. So, continuous murmur has a quality of a soft venous hum and is maximum at left upper sternal border. Obstructed Vertical vein will also cause continuous murmur, which may gives rise to symptoms to the patient, like pulmonary edema, which is called uh, due to the compression of the vertical vein between the pulmonary trunk and the uh, trachea. Uh, so uh, it is called as hemodynamic vice, and patient may have frequent pulmonary edemas even uh, in cases with supracardiac TAPs. So this is okay. an example. Sometimes supracardiac uh, TAPVC can have can have uh, large uh, yes, stenos yes. stenos stenosis at the site where it opens into superior vena cava and yes, uh, and that itself can contribute to development of pulmonary venous pressure, continuous murmur, and also sometimes even pulmonary edema because of the uh, severe elevation of the pulmonary venous pressure. That yes, can yes. happen. Yes. Yes, sir. So branch PA stenosis, that is branch pulmonary artery stenosis. Continuous murmur is uncommon in branch based stenosis, but if it is present, that signifies the pressure gradient extending beyond the diastole due to narrowing of branch pulmonary arteries. So both upper parastern, uh, this uh, branch PA stenosis continuous murmur uh, uh, is uh, present in both upper parasternal, infraaxillary, or interscapular areas. Uh, most important point, which is you know, uh, examiners ask. There is loud P2 without pH. What is the diagnosis? Either if it is not ASD, so loud P2 without pH, uh, branch PA stenosis, you can have continuous murmur as well. So this is an additional finding with a continuous murmur, loud P2 without pH. We should suspect branch PA stenosis. But usually, uh, uh, what is the pressure pattern in a patient with? Uh, Uh, branch pulmonary uh, pulmonary, uh, pulmonary branch stenosis. 
What is the usual pressure pattern? Pressure pattern, sir. Pulmonary artery pressure, uh, branch PA pressures will be lower due, due to the stenosis. Sir. No, no, no. Before the stenosis, not after the stenosis. Usually, before the stenosis, uh, it should be higher, sir. Which one will be higher? I am not sure, sir. Which one will be higher? I am not sure. Gavara, would you like to make a comment? Saroj, Saroj, would you like to give a comment? Which will be higher means right or left, sir? No, like no, that no, 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 no. A systolic pressure or diastolic pressure, mean pressure or all? Systolic will be higher. Systolic will be higher. So, that is one. And if you are shown a pressure data in the pulmonary mm -hmm. artery where systolic pressure is very high and mm -hmm. diastolic pressure is almost normal, that mm -hmm. is a case of uh, um, peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis. That is a classical uh, pressure uh, pressure uh, pattern of a uh, peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis patient where the systolic pressure will be very high, maybe about mm -hmm. depending upon the steno stenosis segment, while the diastolic pressure will be almost normal. Okay, okay. So, so uh, but usually in these patients, uh, continuous murmurs is not very common because of the low diastolic pressure. They will have a good systolic murmur and uh, so, uh, of, of course it is described that patients with uh, peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis can have continuous murmur but it is usually rare because of the low diastolic pressure in the pulmonary artery system. Yes. Okay. Yes. Actually, when after you explained, sir, here we can in the Doppler pattern we can see very high systolic pressures and the diastolic pressures are very low almost. No, that's you. That's usual pattern. Once yes, once yes. that pattern is seen, even without auscultating, you should be able to think that this could be a case of peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll go ahead, sir. Yeah, go now, ahead. Now, truncus arteriosus. So, truncus arteriosus. Usually, bronchial collaterals to site of hypoplastic pulmonary arteries ra rarely may erase, give rise to continuous murmur. Constricted branch PAs or bronchopulmonary collaterals can cause continuous murmurs in truncus arteriosus. Uh, narrowed pulmonary ostia uh, will have continuous murmur and uh, in truncus arteriosus. And uh, usually, uh, these patients will present with cyanosis with heart failure in uh, early neonatal period. However, this truncus uh, arteriosus mostly readily diagnosed uh, at, as presentation on, only is very early. They will this continuous murmur will be associated with um, associated with uh, MDM at apex, mid systolic murmur in the third and fourth left intercostal space, and aortic uh, truncal valve regurgitation murmur, early uh, diastolic murmur will be present. ECG in these patients will show LVH left atrial enlargement or even biventricular hypertrophy. Hemodynamically, this uh, particular condition is something like PDA, where the blood is flowing from the uh, 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 aorta to the pulmonary artery, here the, from the uh, truncus to the pulmonary artery. Yes. So yes. pulmonary artery is actually a branch of the truncus. And so, it may hemodynamically and also hemodynamically it may behave something like a PDA. Of course, this is a sinus patient, but Hemodynamically, PDA can be equated to the hemodynamics of uh, pulmonary uh, uh, truncus with a stenosed pulmonary artery or maybe the opening of the pulmonary artery stenos giving rise to a continuous problem. Yes, sir. Sir, we came across a 30 years old truncus patient. Oh, I see. Yes, sir. 30 years old, we was like, uh, uh, he survived because of the osteostenosis. Yes, yes, yes. Because it, it, it behaves like a pulmonary stenosis because, you know, in a patient with cyanosis, it is actually the stenosis of the RV outflow or a pulmonary stenosis which protects the patient. So, if yes, the patient yes. with truncus arteriosus is to survive, then the stenosis yes. of the origin of the pulmonary artery should be significant enough so that yes, pulmonary yes. arteries are well protected. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is what happened in that patient, 30 years old, adult truncus, uh, was symptomatic for one year, not be before oh, that. Oh, he was a sports person rather. Oh, I see. Oh, yes, unusual, yes. unusual situation. Okay. Very unusual situation, but yes, uh, yes he had. Uh, uh, significant branch PA stenosis. I uh, mean, yeah. not branch PA, sorry, significant osteal pulmonary artery stenosis. Yeah, because uh, it is the, when the osteal or the pulmonary artery protected. stenosis, they are protected actually. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, now, continuous murmur due to surgical shunts. 
so bt shunt water shunt and uh, got x shunt can have a uh, continuous murmurs bt shunt can have continuous can produce continuous murmur which is best heard in intraclavicular area or sometimes even at the back water shunt may produce continuous murmur in first or second left intercostal space like pdas however um, they are not as loud uh, and as harsh as pda and got extent may also have intraclavicular continuous murmur so these are uh, these are the shunts uh, which surgically created shunts which can produce precordial continuous extra precordial continuous murmur now congenital pulmonary artery fistula so this condition can give rise to continuous murmur with a louder systolic component over the lower lobes and middle lobe of the right lung because it's more common in right side the murmur increases on inspiration in on standing and with muller's maneuver it decreases during valsalva maneuver the the most important point is if patient has no cyanosis uh, so if patient sorry if patient has cyanosis without any other precordial murmur or abnormality there is no cardiac abnormality suspected then one should look for uh, pulmonary or arteriovenous fistula so this is an x ray of pulmonary av fistula actually when you are uh, when you are seeing a patient with a uh, uh, pulmonary arteriovenous fistula you can do a screening of that patient and as you rightly said ask the patient to do a muller's procedure then the the fistula will increase in size then you yes, ask yes. the patient to do a valsalva procedure maneuver then the this level will uh, shrink in size so yes, yes. by screening actually you can diagnose the uh, shadow the, the shadow of the pulmonary artery venous fistula by muller's procedure it increases in size and by uh, valsalva maneuver it decreases in size yes sir actually when patient is not suspected to have any cardiac anomaly but patient still has cyanosis we should suspect Uh, pulmonary edema. Yeah, that's a very good point to uh, uh, consider the, the diagnosis of pulmonary artery venous fistula, where everything else is normal, and then the patient is significantly cyanosed. Yes. Sir. So we'll go ahead, sir. Okay. Now venous arm. The how much, how much time more you need? I think. Sir, I may need uh, 10 minutes. Oh. 15 minutes max. Oh, that's 15. too much. I think you have to cut short. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I will cut short. Sir, Vena, some we all know. I won't go in details of yeah, it. Yes, yes. So it's the universal finding in young children. Okay. Second class, sir. You can have a second class also. No, no, no. We we'll finish. We we'll finish. We we'll finish fast. Next, all slides are small. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. We have covered almost major part. Yeah, major things have covered. So I think you can quickly go through the rest of it. Yes, then. Sir. the murmur of vena sum is increased by upright position and deep inspiration and uh, during diastole if the vena sum is audible in supine position suspect a hyperdynamic circulatory state this is these are uh, important clinical points regarding vena sum this murmur uh, uh, now extra thoracic continuous murmur so critical stenosis of any major arteries can have continuous murmur due to the continuous gradient uh, pressure gradient uh across the stenotic segment so carotid femoral renal the all uh, all major arteries if they are significantly stenosed can have continuous murmur then congenital or acquired av fistulas can have continuous murmur due to uh, pressure uh, uh, flow fr uh, from high pressure to low pressure zone uh, acquired av fistulas are seen in um, uh, patients on hemodialysis we, where we create av fistula will have definitely have a continuous murmur and a thrill so another one is congenital av malformations which can have con uh, continuous murmur typically uh, you know uh, here is a example of cerebral av malformation can sometimes produce continuous murmur over scalp and left the, in the second image you can see a left supra uh, clavicular area continuous murmur in patient with high output failure patient presented with high output failure had a Uh, subclavian artery to vertebral vein uh, av malformation which produced a supra uh, supra uh, clavicular continuous murmur in patients with high output failure uh, uh, which ventricle will fail rv sir rv sir rv 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 okay rv that fails even though the problem is on the initially the uh, because of the systemic circulation uh, so artery to the venous communication 
everybody has got a tendency to think that it is the lv which fails no it is the rv fails even in thyrotoxicosis it is the rv which fails yes sir and so tr is more prominent sir tr is more prominent not because of the tr because these patients can develop pulmonary artery hypertension because you know the pulmonary vascular resistance is extremely low it cannot go down further so when the cardiac output increases significantly from 5 liters to about uh, 20 or 25 liters the pulmonary vascular resistance which may, which may not go down uh, it may remains the same as uh, normal pulmonary vascular resistance because of the high flow the pulmonary artery pressure goes up and that patients develop because of the quick rise in the pulmonary artery pressure these patients go in for right heart failure so there are toxicosis anemia very very uh, large av fistula or can give rise to right heart failure and another, another important point is that in a child uh, newborn child baby the child is in heart failure and you are not able to find out anything wrong with the heart on the auscultation always you must auscultate the skull and if the patient yes. is a continuous murmur you must always suspect the possibility of large uh, intracranial artery venous malformation so artery venous communications yes sir yes sir yes sir right now uh, another one is porto systemic shunts like in uh, uh, we can see we can hear a uh, continuous murmur so uh, we have done with the differential diagnosis uh, of continuous murmur now these few end slides are for viva purpose uh, you uh, they are taken from manjuran sir's notes so they are very important please uh, means uh, you must have this notes with you if you don't have you can just uh, screenshot the slides so continuous murmurs with cyanosis differential diagnosis is trough with pulmonary atresia with macus truncus arteriosus tapvc with uh, with or without obstruction pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum with pda severe per peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis duct dependent cyanotic congenital heart diseases like hlhs uh, post shunt surgery and congenital pulmonary av fistulas we'll have continuous murmurs with cyanosis now can there be can i have the previous slide yes sir okay. how can there be cyanosis in severe peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis how can there be cyanosis in severe peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis sir if both the severe peripheral pulmonary arteries are stenosed it will behave like uh, uh, top physiology sir why Even, even if they are having the um, uh, peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis involving both the branches of the pulmonary artery how can there be cyanosis cyanosis can occur only if there is a some mixing of the blood from the right side to the left side yes sir so unless there is a communication you cannot have a cyanosis in the peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis there should yeah, be some communication some yes, there should be some communication otherwise it cannot happen yes. Okay. So, I think uh, peripheral, per, uh, severe peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis by itself cannot give rise to cyanosis unless there is some uh, communication communication through which there can be a right left shunt. Ah, okay, sir. Okay, okay sir. Yes. Okay, right. Sir. right. So, uh, continuous murmurs best heard in second, first and second left intercostal space. Uh, diagnosis differentials are PDA, sometimes AP window, port shunt, water shunt. memory shuffle alkappa and rsov2 pulmonary artery now continuous murmurs best audible in third and fourth left intercostal space include rsov2 rv associated with thrill rsov2 ra associated with thrill coronary cavernal fistulas there will be no thrill memory shuffle no thrill continuous murmurs over back diagnosis differentials are severe coarctation collateral sin coarctation of aorta pulmonary av fistula continuous murmurs in third right intercostal space lutenbacher syndrome with restrictive ast and mitral atresia with restrictive ast now continuous murmur in second right intercostal space suspect tapvc into svc uh, or systemic uh, uh, arteriovenous fistula when continuous murmur is associated accentuated with is present with accentuated diastolic component suspect di RSOV, Alcapa, or a vena sum. So these are my notes. If you want, you can screenshot. However, I could not make slides out of it at all. Oh, this is too. Uh, too uh, these too, are very you know busy slides. Very very busy slides. These are notes, sir. Uh, but I can describe in two minutes. 
So PDA, if patient has some syndromic features, history, heart failure at four to six weeks of birth or bounding pulses, active precordium, female more common than male, and a noisy machinery continuous murmur which peaks around S2 with eddies sound in second left intercostal space in Eddie, uh, Gibson's area, ECG with uh, left atrial enlargement LVH will will. Uh, I think I think uh, Monica. I think we'll have two three minutes for people to ask questions. I think. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, yes, I think yes, that will be it. I think you have done yes, a very good presentation. I think we'll now leave uh, people to give any comments or any questions. So I come conclude here, sir. Thank you so much. Very good. Very good. You have extensively covered. So anybody who would like to ask questions or any any doubts to be raised, then that can be discussed. Saroj, you are unusually silent today. Anybody who would like to give any any comments or any any questions or any any points to be clarified? I think she, uh, sir, uh, Monica has made most of things very clear. But still, if there are any doubts, any 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 points to be raised, we can definitely discuss those points. Sir, good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. I was wondering. My mic was not working today. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> some problem. Just, I, I don't know, some problem was there. So it was very good uh, presentation by Dr. Monica. Sir. I think she has covered extensively. Mm. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Dr. Can we have the slides, ma'am? Thank you for the acceptance. Can we have the slides, ma'am? Can you forward the slides? I, <laughs> not possible. <laughs> It is a very, I have put a lot of efforts in preparing. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, Almost the entire pearl off I had to read. <laughs> I, think you have, uh, I think you have done a very wonderful job. And also you have covered every aspect of uh, continuous murmur. I think that's very good. And uh, those who are appearing for the examination, all the questions that can come up from the continuous murmur has been already clarified and also uh, uh, put in its in appropriate position so that hemodynamically also you can explain all the continuous murmur. Very good. Excellent. So I think uh, with that, we will close the today's session. Next Friday, there won't be any discussion because I have to attend the CSI at uh, Hyderabad and we will have a session there on the, uh, Friday after next when Monica will present a very interesting congenital cyanotic heart disease so that there will be excellent discussion and all of you can come prepared so that we'll have a very fruitful session. Yes, sir. So this, uh, this case actually is uh, for exam sake, uh, even for me, for my preparation as well as for others. Uh, it's a complex congenital heart, uh, heart disease. Uh, so basically cyanotic heart disease should be covered. Sir will teach us a lot. So, so we can have a discussion on all aspects of cyanotic congenital heart disease so that um, in the history itself we can cover a lot of points and when after the physical findings also we can cover a lot of points so that before uh, before we look at the echo we already are making the diagnosis or very we are very close to the diagnosis yes sir yes sir it will okay. be a great learning from you sir. Uh, okay thank you. thank you monica thank you thank you okay Thank you, sir. Good night. Sir. Thanks, Good night. everybody. Good night. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, from here now, I'm in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.